All right, so last lecture in hash functions, I want to show you an example of how hash functions are constructed. And I've chosen the sponge construction because it's the most recent one, and I'm going to show you on the second slide like why we care about those things. Um, if you want to go into the analysis of hash functions, um, there's a lot of material online. There's also um, every second year Max Davis is lecturing course. He's one of the experts on breaking hash functions. Particularly, he has uh, done the practical attack against SHA-1 and several of the practical attacks against MP5. Um, here, for once, I'm picking the side of security rather than attacks. And I want to show you the latest design that is in the more recent um, SHA-3 family. So this design is based on what is called a sponge. Now, a sponge, you know from the kitchen, cleaning or from your shower or whatever um, is like the first thing which can absorb a lot of water and you can squeeze out the water later on. And so the reason that this thing is called a sponge function or sponge construction is that there is a phase which is called the absorbing phase and what you see happening here is that parts of the message come in. These mi are blocks of the message. So let's assume that we have a long message, that's typical of quantum hash. Um, each block has R bits. I'm going to show you one example of how well, Sha3 in particular pants the message. Um, so you can just think of okay, if there are some bits missing to make the length of the multiple of R, you fill up with zeros, or what I'm going to show you the next slide is you fill up with one zero zero one. Something that everybody knows they could ignore or they could recompute. And then each of these blocks of R bits comes in separate. And that's called the absorbing phase. So that part, you have a small sponge which is growing bigger and bigger and bigger and now has all the information from the message. And then comes the squeezing phase. In the squeezing phase, you're outputting parts of the hash. Now, in reality, this might be just one part or two parts because typically our hash outputs are short of typically 224, 256, 384, or 512. Um, and if this length R, so the top bits here, if that is already longer than the output length, we only output one block. So then the whole thing ends only here. And you might even have to truncate uh, one of those. But sometimes, well, if your R is particularly small, or your output length is particularly big, you actually do more steps and output more blocks. But there is some fine number of blocks. Now what happens? What is happening inside this sponge? All the way inside I won't go, so I won't show you what is really happening inside. You would need to look at what's in this function f. I will only tell you that this is a permutation. Now this permutation takes r plus c bits. So there's the top r bits, and this R is called the rate because it determines the rate at which the message is absorbed and it determines the rate at which hash part or hash blocks are output. And then there is C, the capacity. So at every moment, your F takes in R plus C bits, permutes them, and outputs R plus C bits. And it's important to see that there is kind of a separation throughout this whole picture. The permutation will mix the bits around, but when you XOR message blocks, you only XOR in the top R bits. You never touch the capacity bits. Of course, a bit which is in the capacity bit at the beginning, while well, it's just zero, will end it up the permutation state up here, so it might be now in the rate bits, or it might still be down here. And at that point, it gets uh, XOR with the next message block, but it's important that there is some part which gets passed on and that the attacker, and well, thinking of the attacker as the person who's choosing the messages, the attacker wants to find three images or collisions, the attacker cannot control what is happening in this bottom part. In the top part, they can quickly overwrite the pieces by choosing the right message blocks, but the bottom part here, C, is outside their control. And I've actually um, drawn this picture more to scale to indicate that the 
R, the weight part, is typically smaller than the capacity part. We will see that the capacity part determines the security or controls the security. The weight part controls the efficiency. Okay, so since this is the only slide with a picture, let me run through it again. So we initialize the state at zero. So the state is this R plus C bits. And then we XOR the message into the first block. Sorry, the first block, so the M0, into the R part of the state. So at this moment, we have M0 over 0. And then we let this F run. And F is a permutation. We could think of this kind of as a as a hardwired thing. It takes one bit, move it there, put it there, put it there. Now, we're not going to look into the details of F. It does have a nice description. It's written for the SHA-3 or Ketchak in particular. It's written in a particular way to kind of visualize what is happening with the bits so that you have a good mixing of all bits. It's not that some bits always twiddle their sums and just gets passed through. It's not that some bits get particularly fast, some bits get particularly short. Um, it's a good permutation. It's something that could have been chosen randomly. Of course, it's not chosen randomly because you also want it to be efficient. So efficiency, one part is the rate, the other part is how is this F chosen. Security, one part is the capacity, and of course also the output length, how many bits you output. If you only output two bits, it can't be collision resistant. Um, so the, the uh, security for the output length, it depends on the output length, and the efficiency depends on well, output. Sorry, security depends on output length and capacity. The efficiency depends on how fast we input and output, and also how this permutation works. And then also, of course, we have to choose a secure permutation. So it can also mess up in that part. Now, for the details, um, SHA-3 is, well, that's the name, after the, it was standardized by NIST, so this is the US National Standard uh, Institute for Standards and Technology. In 2015, they finally published this, this new uh, standard. The competition started in 2008 or 2007, even lots of people submitted their designs, something on the scale of 64, and then it was narrowed down to five finalists, and then eventually Ketchak uh, was chosen as the one standard, and in 2015 the standard was finalized. The choice was already back in 2013. Now, these are several functions, so the SHA-3 family um, is indexed by sha 3 d and D is the number of output bits. All of these uh, SHA-3s, all Ketchaks, share that the rate plus the capacity is 1600. So they have a fixed permutation function which takes those 1600 bits and scrambles them around. Okay, now that we have a fixed function, I also need to explain to you how the different parts work. So everything on here is just copied from the previous slide, but you can see there's lots of white space we're going to uh, fill in the details. So how do we actually pad? So what we're doing is we take the message M and then we append a pad P. And this pad, well, is at least the first one and the last one, and then filled up with zeros in the middle so that the block size R divides the length of, well, the message followed by the pad. Now the best case or the, the smallest expansion is if only two bits are missing. So if you have something which has block lengths well, if it's R, 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 and then finally it's R minus 2, so just two bits missing. Then it just appends those two ones, and it's done. In the worst case, it's just one over if it's R, 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 and then R minus 1. Because you must append two bits, well, it appends a 1 here, and then it takes another bit, another new block. In this new block, it will have r minus one zeros and then the last one, because it must have this one and that one. So then the n that was on the picture, the m, well, one till zero, uh, till n, actually, I should have done m minus one, sorry for that. Um, that is the length 
of this headed message divided by r, so it's the number of blocks. Okay, so then the output blocks, um, if you want to have p bits of output, then you, well, this is a choice depending on the security level. And as I said, the name already encapsulates this. And the output blocks, um, well, if you generate the first output block, the h0, if d is larger than what you need, you already truncate this, so you're not outputting the whole thing, but you're only outputting the part that you wanted to receive, so just p bits. If r is smaller than d, then you do another f, and well, then you do more of the squeezing phase, so that is another f, and then again you take the top r bits, you don't need to output those, is that enough? Maybe this is now 2r is larger than d, or larger or equal to d, then you're done. Else, well, you output more and so on. You can already see how you could turn this into something which has a much, much larger output length, so something which is just generating uh, blocks on demand. But for a hash function, well, the, the goal is not to have a fixed length output. And then the f thing, while well, it's a permutation, in this case 1600 bits, um, it should be efficient and it should look random. So security proofs do rely on this being a random permutation. Of course, it's not a random permutation because it's one single permutation which is fixed and it's been heavily optimized, but it should be that the bit pattern that it creates, like how the bits flow around, should be like a random function would do it. And that's a lot of hand waviness, but that is also where much of the competition is focused. Because the nice and clean part of having a sponge function is that of the outer part, lots of things can be proven based on the assumption that f is a random permutation. So in particular, if you have the capacity c, then assuming that f is random, you can prove, again, remember proofs are security reductions, so under the assumption that f is a random function, pre-image security and second pre-image security or at least 2 to the c over 2, and that's where the capacity comes in. And then, of course, uh, if the output size is too small, then that could be worse than the c over 2. So it's the minimum of 2 to the c over 2 and 2 to the d. The 2 to the d is what we know for a generic hash attack. So if you have p bits of output, you can always solve pre image resistance and second pre image resistance in 2 to the d steps. The other one, the 2 to the c over 2, that's new and specific to the sponge construction. And again, that is assuming that f is random. So the security reduction there um, would be finding a non-random property in f. So it would say, well, assume that we can break pre image resistance, then we would find some non-random properties of f. And then similarly, the collision resistance, well, it can't be better than 2 to the d over 2, but for the, the sponge construction, it doesn't actually get worse than for pre image resistance. So here's the minimum of 2 to the c over 2 and d to the, uh, 2 to the d over 2. And then finally, the rate is how many bits are processed. So since the r plus c is 1600, if you have a larger capacity, the rate goes down and vice versa. So what has been proposed uh, for SHA-3, the choices are that the C capacity is in 2 to the 20, uh, 224, so that would give 120, uh, 112 security level, would be 2 to the 6, which gives 128 bit security level, and then two reasonable numbers of 2 to the 100, of the 92 bit security and uh, 2 to the 6 bit security. Okay, so this is how the catch-up function works on the outside and how you can analyze the security um, of the function as a, well, in terms of the size of the capacity. So these are still kind of the best cases. So if your permutation is good, that's the best you can achieve. But then spend your time, study the randomness of this permutation, maybe do a scaled-down version. That's also what, what Sharp 3 has been doing, what catch has been doing is that they're proposed versions that look like Ketchak, but are smaller, so that you actually have a chance of seeing any potential weakness. Well, no real weakness detected in the last uh, six years, so this is now a good standard 
and there have been some extensions already to turn the cities up, which gives you more bits, so it's a compression function, but it's also a pseudo-manner generator.